Good afternoon, and welcome to the CHCI Immigration Plenary Session. To begin today's session, please welcome Lucero Ortiz, volunteer attorney with the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CHCI's closing plenary session on immigration. My name is Lucero Ortiz, and I was a law fellow in 2007-2008, and I'd like to welcome each and one of you today. On behalf of CHCI and the Alumni Association, I'd first like to start by thanking Bank of America, which is the 2014 CHCI Public Policy Conference host. And in addition, I'd like to thank the SEIU for sponsoring this very important session. Please, let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. In addition to my role as an alumni of CHCI, I'm also here to share a little bit about the work that I've been doing as an immigration attorney um, to really frame this conversation. Um, as many of you in the room and many of the alumni in CHCI, um, I come from a mixed family. I was born and raised in California to Mexican immigrant parents. In my family, yes, California, immigrants, everything. Uh, coming from a mixed family, my parents and older brother were born in Mexico, and through um, the IRCA law in 1986, were able to naturalize and become U.S. citizens. In my family, I also have legal permanent residents that have been legal permanent residents for too long. And despite my efforts to really ensure that they become citizens, they are still legal permanent residents. And in my family, I also have undocumented members of my family who have been here for over 20 years and unfortunately have not been able to um, adjust their status given that they have no options to petition. So we really think about um, this topic and the importance of immigration reform. I think all of us can really look to either our families or our communities for individuals whose lives have really been um, put on, a, on, on hold, on a standstill, given the fact that there has been no movement in many, many years. For the last 60 years, Immigration reform in one capacity or another came every 10 to 15 years. So we had some movement in the 70s, we had some movement in the 80s, obviously 86 was pretty big. In 96 we had some reform. And then in 2006, we all thought that was gonna be it. Uh, many of you in the room might have joined one of the millions of marches across the country where hundreds of millions of people came and spoke um, about the need for comprehensive immigration reform. And we thought, this is it, 2006 is gonna be the year. And unfortunately, it wasn't. And then 2008 came around. Um, and with the economic downturn, unfortunately, we saw a lot of immigrant communities uh, be scapegoated for a lot of the uh, economic troubles that we saw in, in our communities. Um, therefore, we're long overdue. The time is now. Our community members really need um, this issue to, to continue not only to stay elevated in, in public dialogue, but really action to be taken. Um, just to share a quick story, one of my aunts, uh, mi tia Sarita, uh, in California, has been in this country for over 20 years. She has two um, sons who are both US military um, Marine Corps uh, members. And when they graduated from um, their course at Camp Pendleton, Unfortunately, she was not able to go to their graduation. Being that she's undocumented, she did not want to run the risk of being caught at one of the immigration um, stations very near Camp Pendleton. This is just one of many stories that, again, this is in my family, but I'm sure you know of many stories like this one. The time is now, and this conversation is, is again, uh, necessary to be elevated um, as much as possible to make sure that we have action very, very soon. Um, with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and get the conversation started. Again, we've waited long enough, so let's not wait any longer. To help us frame the conversation, we are very pleased to have with us today the chairman of the Democratic Caucus, Representative from California, Javier Becerra. Please help me welcome him. Lucero, thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for Lucero as well for all that she has been doing? Haven't I seen you before? I, uh, I was just here a little while ago, and it's a great pleasure to be here again with you all. Thank you for attending. We're going to have a great session to discuss something that's near and dear to so many of us and something that we will, I believe, soon 
have resolved, and that is making sure we fix a broken immigration system for our families, for our economy, and for our security. It will come. And I will tell you, yes, that's right, let's applaud. There you go. There's no better example of why we must get this done and the beauty of when we will get it done than the two people I'm about to introduce to you because they are our future and they are the reason why immigration reform must be done now. Let me introduce to you two individuals who qualified for the Deferred Action Program, which President Obama began in 2013, which said to young people who really have no, no, no country other than the U.S. as their home, that they could come out of the shadows, that they could go to those schools if they were the valedictorians in their high school, they would go on to college, that they could go on to work, that they could actually live a life the way all of us take for granted. Please help me in welcoming two individuals who are, as a result of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's work, part of America's working fabric here in Washington, D.C. Luis Calcater, fall 2014, congressional intern with CHCI who works in Senator Boxer's office. Hometown, Fresno, California. He is gaining a degree in political science at Cal State University, Fresno. And let me also ask Jose Garcia Madrid, 2014-2015 public policy fellow for CHCI. Jose is in Senator Harry Reid's office, the majority leader in the Senate. His hometown is Las Vegas. His area of study is women's studies, and he's at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Please, for the reasons that we know we must get this done, please give both of these gentlemen a round of applause. Luis and Jose, congratulations. You make us very, very proud. Now I have the pleasure of introducing someone else who has made us very, very proud because of the work that she has done to make sure that Luis and Jose have an opportunity to be here standing in front of you working for some of the most powerful people in America. Georgia Foley, Georgia, where are you? Can she come out please if she is here? Georgia? The dreamers get to dream and they get to dream in public because of people like Georgia. Georgia has been working very hard with a number of folks. As a member of the Dream Team USA, well, Dream Team USA, and because of the work that they do, she, along with other folks like Candy Marshall, Henry Munoz, Don Graham, and Gabby Pacheco, they've developed the largest scholarship fund for dreamers in America. And so, as a result of this fund and these scholarships these dreamers are able to apply for the DACA program. They're able to go on and actually go on to get a college degree or finish their careers and become productive Americans. So to Georgia Foley, we want to give you a round of applause. Are you going to say some words? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Congressman Becerra and CHCI for having me here today and for all the great work that you do. My name is Georgia Foley and I am part of the Dream.us team. The Dream.us is a national scholarship fund that provides scholarships to highly motivated dreamers who, without financial aid, cannot afford a college education. In just over a year, we have currently raised $33.5 million and our goal is to reach 50. We have to date provided over 300 scholarships under the direction of our founders and the rest of my team, Candy Marshall and Gabby Pacheco. The fall 2014 scholarship round is now open and uh, is now open until October 26th and we need all of you to please help us spread the word. So today I ask you, and I know that most of you, if not all of you, have a cell phone on you. So please get on Facebook or Twitter and write this very simple line. Know a hashtag dreamer who wants to go to college. Tell them about the Dream.us scholarship. Thank you. Georgia, thank you very much. So let's move on. Uh, many of us were thrilled when we got word that Tom Perez, who did a magnificent job working 
in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice was nominated by our President, President Barack Obama, to serve us as Secretary of the Department of Labor. And he has gone on not only to become the Secretary of Labor, but to actually be, over the last several months, probably the cabinet member on President Obama's team who's traveled most often with the President over the la these last several months, of, as I've mentioned. At the same time, he's done something very important. He's focused, focused in ways that have to make all of us proud. He's making sure that we work hard to make it possible for everyone who works to make sure they get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. He's connecting ready-to-work Americans with ready-to-fill jobs. He's promoting gender equality in the workplace. He's ensuring that people with disabilities and our veterans have access to equal employment opportunities. And he's insisting on safe and level playing fields for all Americans at the workplace. He is transforming what we think of as our Secretary of Labor. And he is doing this all in a way that makes us so proud that he's an American and a member of our country. But a lot of us think that that's just one step along the very successful path of Tom Perez. Many of us believe that following the great work of Eric Holder as our Attorney General for the Department of Justice, that we have a great name of someone who could be nominated to replace Attorney General Holder. I, for one, would place my vote with Tom Perez. It sounds really good, Attorney General Perez. And I don't know if you agree, but perhaps what you could do, perhaps what you can do is help me acknowledge the Secretary of Labor by giving him a warm round of applause and encourage him to become the next Attorney General of the United States of America. Our Secretary of Labor, Tom Perez. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I had a little bit of throat surgery uh, 10 days ago, so if I sound a little raspy or, you know, like Vito Corleone, uh, I apologize. But uh, my support uh, for this institute and for the cause of opportunity, I assure you, is full-throated. And so uh, it's an honor to be here. And, you know, Javier Becerra is one of my heroes. I think he's one of the most effective uh, public servants I have ever met, and I wanted to say uh, thank you to you, Congressman and, and friend, uh, for all you're doing. And, and Lucero, in case you haven't known, she's a DOL alum, uh, did great work there and continues to do uh, great work expanding opportunity. And uh, Esther Aguilera is a, uh, a neighbor and a friend and does great work leading this fantastic organization. So um, congrats to all of you, and, and thanks for having me. And uh, sometimes the trial lawyer and me, I start walking a little bit. So if you see me walking from side to side, it's because I, I can't help it. Uh, you know, I was in New York yesterday, actually, with uh, Bill de Blasio. Bless you. Bless all of you, for that matter, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were talking about opportunity for everyone. We were about uh, 15 minutes from where my mother grew up in Washington Heights. My family were uh, Dominican. Hay Dominicanos en la casa. Okay, here we go. Um, my, my family, uh, you know, they got kicked out. There was a terrible dictator, uh, Trujillo, and my family had to leave. And my mother and her family, uh, we settled in uh, Mecca for Dominicans at the time was Washington Heights. And, uh, and so to be there yesterday during Hispanic Heritage Month was a wonderful reminder of uh, how far we've come and, and frankly how far we need to go. And, and I look at some of the metrics of progress, and Arnie Duncan probably talked to you this morning about the fact that we've reduced the Latino dropout rate uh, by 50% over the last 10 years. That's a real point of progress. Uh, you look at the ACA data and uh, the um, uninsurance rate. You know, Latinos are uh, the most uninsured of any population, but that's gone down by roughly 20% in the last year, thanks to so many people in this room, thanks to the leadership of President Obama, and thanks to so many folks who got out there and got the word out in our communities. And we're going to keep doing that under the leadership of Secretary Burwell uh, as we move forward, because that's a real uh, point of pride. You look at poverty reduction. We've had uh, the largest reduction in the past year, one-year reduction in um, Latino poverty rates in the last 15 years. 
So we're moving in the right direction. Um, at the same time, we all know that we've got a lot of challenges. And uh, we see these challenges. We live these challenges every single day. And, and what I'd like to do is, is re reflect on uh, really three lessons uh, that I have learned over the course of the five years that I've had the privilege of serving. And it has been an unmitigated uh, privilege for me to serve under this president during these times. Because the president is all about opportunity, expanding opportunity. And, and I've learned three basic lessons that I think have a real relevance to this conversation about immigration. The, the first lesson I learned, and this lesson I learned long ago, really when I was board chair at uh, Casa Maryland, uh, which is a wonderful uh, grassroots nonprofit. And, and the thing I learned was you got to make house calls, whether you're the labor secretary, whether you're the head of the Civil Rights Division, or whether you're the chair of a nonprofit, you got to make house calls. And I've made a lot of house calls in this job. You know, I was out in Houston recently and I met a woman named Astroberta. Uh, she inspires me. She's been a janitor for over 30 years in Houston. She's making eight bucks an hour right now. She's organizing other similar uh, folks to fight for a better life. She lamented the fact that she didn't have health insurance. And I explained to her, if you lived in California, Astroberta, you would have health insurance because they expanded Medicaid. But your governor made a choice, and it's a choice that's hurting you and so many others, and that's why you live in the health uninsurance capital of the United States, which is unfortunate. But she inspires me, and they helped organize a labor union, and they've helped organize low-wage workers in Houston, and she has an optimism and determination about her. You know, and then I had the privilege last year of doing my daughter's high school graduation speech. And it was one of the privileges of my life. She went to a school here in Maryland, Montgomery Blair High School, the largest school in, the, uh, in Maryland and one of the most diverse schools in Maryland. And, and I wanted, before I did the graduation ceremony, I wanted to talk to some of the students. And I met uh, Luis, uh, a kid that I knew a little bit, but I didn't know uh, that much. And, and he's a classmate and a friend of uh, my daughter, Amalia. And, and he's got such a bright future. He is so smart. He was basically a straight-A student, and he's a DACA student. And I said to him, you have my word that we are going to make sure that your future is bright because you have done everything right. You continue to excel, and we need you in America. It's an economic imperative. And when you make house calls and you see people like this, and, and I met other DACA kids in our office, I met someone whose parents uh, live in Bangladesh. I met another whose parents live in the Philippines. Uh, and you know, the thing I remember from those meetings was on Mother's Day, all he could do because his mother had been deported is to call her and wish her happy Mother's Day. That's not who we are as a nation. And, and, and I bring this up because I think it's really important. And, and the president gets out there in his day of the life because he understands that we can talk numbers all day, but this is talking about real people and the impact that public policy, whether it's access to health care, whether it's Arnie Duncan's work in education, whether it's Maria's work in the small business context, whether it's Julian's work expanding opportunity in urban areas, whatever the context, we have to get out there, and we are getting out there. And, and that's the segue to my, my second observation about lessons learned in, in the job that I've had the privilege of doing for the last five years. And, and that is, it's always most important to get things right. And let me tell you what I mean by that. There was a horrific incident when I was heading up the Civil Rights Division in a town called Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. A young man named Luis Ramirez, a Mexican national, was in the park with a girlfriend, and he got murdered by a group of racist thugs simply because of who he was, a Mexican national. And there was an understandable outrage in the community and a call, you need to take action and you need to take action now. And I understood that call. And at the outset, we disappointed a number of people because we didn't take action that in their judgment was swift enough. And I couldn't tell you why then, but I can tell you why now, because it's a matter of public record. Because what we learned in that case was that not only were they murdered because of who he was, 
But in the aftermath of the murder, there was a cover-up by the police department. So we had not one, but two cases. And what I learned in that context was, it's most important to get it right. I will never ask people to be patient with me because for some people, their life circumstances don't give them the luxury of being patient. But for us, it's always important to get it right. And I think we got it right in that case. Similarly, when Arizona passed SB 1070 and Alabama passed their series of immigration laws, and I see your body language saying, I remember that time. Your, your, your nervous tick is coming back. I can see it already. And, and there was an understandable concern. What are we going to do? You need to do something, and you need to do something tomorrow. And I understood that. And we understood, and the attorney general and the president, everybody understood the national significance of that, because our immigration system is broken. We can stipulate to that. But at the same time, we had to take a very careful look because we knew there was a good chance that these cases would find their way to the Supreme Court. And we needed to gather and marshal the facts so that we could move forward effectively. And I believe we did. We had to get it right. We have no margin for error in the work that we do. And that is why it is so important to get it right. And that is why, again, I understand the impatience that some may feel. And similarly, there's a sheriff you may know in Arizona that I spent a lot of time taking a look at. And I got a lot of letters from a lot of folk. And you know him. And I suspect, well, I'm going to stop right there, inside voice. Um, and again, the same thing. We need you to do something. We need you to do something now. And the, the fact of the matter is, we had to gather the facts. We had to do a, a fair and impartial review. And those take time. And so we were able to do that. But again, another lesson that I learned that it is so important in the work that we do uh, to make sure that we get things right. And that is why uh, you know, I, I bring this up, because uh, this work was so important. And I'll give you one more example. I had the privilege of working on some matters in Texas involving the redistricting. As you know, Texas had the largest Latino growth in the recent census. And, and, and the largest population growth, overwhelmingly Latino, something like 90%. And yet, when they drew the districts, there was no additional opportunity in Congress uh, for Latinos to elect a candidate of their choice. And there were other concerns, and there was an understandable outcry. And again, you need to do something, we need to do something now. And I understood that instinct. But again, it's always important to get things right. And I'm very proud of the work that we did in that case because we were able to put a case together in which a three-judge panel, two of whom were appointed by Republican presidents, agreed that what they did was discriminatory in the redistricting context. So getting things right has always been our North Star. And sometimes getting things right takes longer and patience is not a luxury that so many people who are suffering have. And that is always the challenge. And, and that brings me to my third and final observation or lesson that I've learned in my job. And that is that leadership and values matter. I just happened coincidentally today to have lunch with two of my favorite people. One guy, his name is Ali Mayorkas, and the other guy is Leon Rodriguez. Those of you who don't know Ali, Ali is the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Homeland Security, and Leon is the head of USCIS. They have two of the most important jobs in the federal government, in so far as the immigration discussion. And I have seen their leadership in action, and I have seen the leadership of their boss in action. I have seen the carefulness with which Secretary Johnson, the thoughtfulness with which he has been approaching these issues. And it has singularly impressed me because he wants to get it right as well. And he understands that getting it right involves listening to everybody, making sure you understand every perspective, your employee's perspective, the community's perspective, every single perspective. And that's what he is doing. And that's what Ali and Leon are doing. 
And I would respectfully assert that those departments, those components are in very good hands because I know their values and I've seen their leadership in action. And there's one other person that I want to talk about with respect to leadership because I've had the privilege of having a front row seat and that is the president. I, you know, I've lived a charmed life. The opportunity to work in the Civil Rights Division, the opportunity to expand opportunity at the Department of Labor. Today we just issued a regulation enforcing the president's minimum wage executive order because we need to set an example as a federal government. If we're asking the private sector to pay a minimum wage, then we need to do the same with federal contractors and that is at the federal register as we speak because nobody who works a full-time job in this country should have to live in poverty. Nobody should have to make the choices. No one should have to make choices between a gallon of milk or a gallon of gas. And, you know, I speak to people all the time who tell me, you know, there's no dignity in a 40 to 50 hour work week when at the end of the week you got to go to the pantry to get your food. That's not dignity and that's not America. And one of the reasons I love working for this president is that I've seen his moral compass in action. And, and you know, I've always said if you're trying to figure out what somebody stands for on an issue, go do some research on what they did before they were in the dramatic public spotlight. And when you look at the president on immigration, his commitment to this issue dates way back to his time in Illinois state government, way, way back, because he has understood, and as someone who has lived overseas, he understands that we are a global universe here in the United States and everywhere. And he understands that we are a nation of immigrants and we are a nation of laws and we can be both. And I have seen those values in action. And, and I wanna share um, a story that uh, I, I had the privilege of having a front row seat on. And, and it was a story about three months ago. We were together in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. We were doing an event uh, surrounding job training. And we were with about 13 young women. Average age was about 17, 18 years old. And they were all in this job training program and they were all uh, moms, single moms. And after all the press had left, the president had some face time with these folks. And they were remarkable young women. They were trying to better their lives. They wanted to make sure that they could make ends meet so that their children could grow up. And, and you should have seen the look in their eye. What'd you do today? Hey, I hung with the president. You know, they're having a good day. And, 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 you know, the president talked to them about how, you know what, my mother was 18 years old when I was born. One of you, you know, may be helping to raise the next president of the United States. It can be you. And then he turned to them and he said, do you have any questions for me? And, and the first question was, if you could accomplish one thing, Mr. President, this year, what would it be? And a nanosecond later, he said, and again, there were no cameras in the room. There were no press in the room. This was, this was a very intimate uh, setting. And I remember vividly, he said, comprehensive immigration reform. Because I have met so many people across this country who want opportunity for whom opportunity continues to be elusive. And Congress has always worked on this issue together. And for some reason, there are some in Congress on one side of the aisle, uh, in one chamber, who aren't allowing this to come on. And, and, and you could just see his values and his leadership in action. And, and so the upshot of what he has said then and what he says today is simple. Our immigration system is broken, plain and simple. The question, and, and, and the best way to fix it is through a bipartisan bill in Congress, like the Senate passed. But absent that, the president, when he, and as he has done with the Department of Labor on minimum wage, on overtime, on so many other issues, he will not hesitate 
to take executive action. So let me be slightly clearer. The question of whether, the question of executive action, my friends, is a when question. Because the question of immigration reform is not a question. The need for immigration reform is an economic imperative. It's a moral imperative. It's a national security imperative. And it is an issue that is all about his values and his leadership. And that's why I love working for this president. And that is why, again, as I said to you about eight minutes ago, the most important thing I've learned in my job is you got to get it right. And I'm confident, because I've worked for this guy for a while and watched him in action, that on immigration, we're going to get it right on the executive side, but we've got to get it right as a society in Congress. And I'm confident that we can do that. And I have the same optimism that Javier Becerra has in this issue. Because everywhere I travel, I talk to business leaders, and they tell me the same thing. We need immigration reform. I, I talk to DACA um, young adults, and, and we owe it to them, as you well know. I talk to faith leaders. I talk to my Republican friends who tell me privately, of course we need this. And that's why I have such optimism, because the people in this room have been catalysts. You know, I, I come from the movement, and I come from a world in which change doesn't happen from the top down, it happens from the bottom up. I was working for Senator Kennedy in 96 during the iteration of immigration reform. There were so many times when they told us we couldn't do things, but we did it. And I am confident that we're going to do it again, because there is so much energy and know-how and stick to in this room. I know Senator Kennedy is in this room in spirit right now. And I know if he were here, he'd be telling you, you never give up the fight. Nothing worth fighting for is ever going to be easy. And this ain't easy. But we will continue to make progress. And let's remember, let's get it right. And let's make sure that we understand our values. And let's make sure we do things that are consistent with our values. And I hope you have seen through the course of five years the values of this president in so many different contexts in action. That has made my current job so much easier, knowing that when we're trying to make sure that low-wage workers recover the wages they're entitled to, that I got a guy who has my back. Knowing that when we take action on voter ID laws or redistricting plans, or in the police setting, that we have the law on our side, we have the facts on our side, and we have leadership on our side. Rem let's remember that, and let's remember, let's get it right. Let's continue to be persistent. We will succeed. Si se puede, no hay duda. Thank you. Another round of applause for Secretary Perez. Thank you. Thank you to the Secretary. And now on to our panel discussion. Uh, but before we move on, I just want to uh, recognize Representative Frank Pallone from the 6th District in New Jersey, who's in attendance. Thank you for your participation. And as the Secretary mentioned, um, I actually am an alumni of CHCI and also of the Obama administration. I had the opportunity to work at the Department of Labor for four years um, and worked on some very um, uh, sensitive but also very timely issues. Um, so again, immigration reform is one of those issues that um, I carry not only in my professional career as an immigration attorney, but something that's also very close to home. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our moderator for today's panel. Um, and that is Jim Avila, the award-winning journalist and senior national uh, correspondent for ABC News. He is also the White House correspondent at Fusion, or Fusion, the ABC Univision joint venture that was launched last year. In his role at ABC, he covers Latino America, immigration reform, education, politics, and issues vitally important to the Latino community. As the fastest growing segment of our population, the Latino community, um, 
is, is important to a lot of the work that he is currently doing. He also continues to contribute to 2020 and other ABC broadcast and platforms specializing in law, justice, and consumer investigations. Please welcome Mr. Jim Avila. Well, good afternoon. Boy, those lights are bright. I can hardly see how many people are out there, but it uh, appears to be a good crowd. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, I just want to, uh, before we start this very important panel, tell you a little bit of why I'm interested in it, uh, why I have, in fact, uh, elected to start uh, covering uh, for ABC News and Fusion uh, the uh, immigration reform debate. Uh, you see, as many of you, um, my parents, my grandparents uh, were immigrants. They came across uh, uh, many years ago in the 20s, actually. My grandparents came across from Chihuahua, Mexico into Texas. They worked in the fields. Uh, they, my grandfather worked in a glass factory and taught himself to read and write in English. And then he raised eight, uh, eight children, all of them professionals. Many of them went to college, and all of them have contributed to society. And that, of course, is the model uh, and what we hope that happens in immigration, with immigration reform. And the reason why uh, that is uh, such an important uh, issue to those in the Hispanic community. But I want to get uh, to this, uh, this panel as soon as we can because it is a distinguished panel. And we have a lot of ground to cover. I want to remind you that uh, as we go along here that we will be taking questions from the audience and there will be members of the staff here who will be going around with microphones. So raise your hand, flag them down. We'll call on you if you have an urgent question that certainly I haven't asked or hasn't been brought up. But let me introduce our panelists first if they'll come into the room. That's your cue. Oh, sorry. Well, let me start uh, right here on my left. Representative Luis Gutierrez, all of you know him. He's in his 11th term in Congress. He's from Chicago, where I be first began covering uh, his work as in politics as a city council member and supporter of Harold Washington back in the early 80s. Uh, we've known each other for that long. Representative Gutierrez, of course, is nationally recognized for his tireless leadership, championing the issues that are particularly important to Latino and immigrant communities. And of course, he's been in the forefront of the immigration reform uh, efforts in Congress. Next to him is Representative Joe Crowley. <laughs> now, Representative Crowley is, in his, um, is a lifelong New Yorker and has served the people of the Bronx and Queens since 1998. He's the vice chair of the Democratic Caucus, and his efforts in Congress are focused on building strong communities, creating jobs, increasing access to health care and housing, protecting seniors, hard-earned benefits, and opening up educational opportunities for working families. Representative Joe Crowley. And that's Anna Navarro. Anna Navarro is a political contributor at CNN and CNN en Español. Anna has played a role in several federal and state races in Florida. Most recently, she served as National Hispanic Co-Chair for Governor John Huntsman's 2012 campaign. Her work in the private sector has included representing private and public clients on federal issues, particularly related to immigration, trade, and policy affecting Central America. And of course, you probably see her on the Sunday panel shows, Anna Navarro. And last but not least is to Reverend Tony Suarez. He is the Vice President of, cha of Chapters of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, serving 40,000 congregations in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, and 500,000 congregations globally. He has been an outspoken advocate for immigration reform in those, po in those posts. So ladies and gentlemen, there's our panel. So first we want to talk sort of about the state of play uh, what's happening now, uh, where we're at with immigration, where we hope to go, and where we think we will go practically. And I'm going to ask each one of you to take a couple minutes, if you would, and talk to us about that before we, uh, before we start the questioning. Congressman Gutierrez. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, and thank you, Jim, for moderating uh, this program. It's a, really an honor to have you here. Um, so the last 
year, we celebrated the fact that Republicans and Democrats were able to come together and put together a uh, comprehensive immigration bill in the Senate. And then there was a group of eight in the House of Representatives, and we continued to work uh, to, to put together a bill. When it became clear that we were not going to have the support of uh, Speaker Boehner and the Republican majority in terms of the process and the product that we were going to, the group disbanded. I continue to work with, uh, with Mario diaz Balart, who is a very dear friend of mine and has been a constant and consistent champion uh, for immigrants, even within his own Republican caucus. And I'm, I think we should all be thankful to him for his fine work and his commitment and his dedication. But, <laughs> but he and I, and a group could not put this together. Uh, we recognized that early this year in January, the Republicans came forward and said, we're gonna give more life and we're gonna, put, uh, we're gonna put our principles out there. And one of the principles was that the dreamers could go straight to American citizenship in their principles. Although principles were not concrete, you could extrapolate that they get to go straight to citizen and we would legalize millions of people. And what the Democrats say, I guess we were so overjoyed, we were too overjoyed because they took it back within a week, right? They said, oh, just kidding. <laughs> it was kind of a sleight of hand. They said, we really didn't mean it. And then they said we had to wait till May or June for all the primaries to be over, for the Republican primaries to be over, and voila, the majority leader lost. And then they said, we're not moving forward. So then the president came forward and said, well, this is what I'm going to do. Since the Republic, I always believed this. The Speaker Boehner and the President had an understanding and had conversations and had a relationship and part of their relationship was we're going to work on immigration reform, we're just not going to. And once the Speaker called him up at the end of uh, June and said, we're not doing this, now he says he's doing it after the elections. Interestingly enough, the same thing Obama said after the elections. Well then the President said, I will take action. I will use prosecutorial discretion. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the president to act. I think he should have acted before the election. I spoke to my daughter, Jessica, yesterday. I spoke to my daughter yesterday. She's in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And she says, Daddy, is that Lady Landrieu a, a Republican? And I say, why? Because she's acting kind of conservative out here number one, and they keep complaining that all she does is vote with Obama. So she must be a Republican who turned her back on the Republicans and supporting the president. And so now they must be angry with her. And I said, no, daughter, she's a Democrat. What's the main issue that they're using out in Louisiana? She says there's two words, illegal immigrants. That that is the basis of the campaign as she as a student sees it on TV. So it really didn't make any difference. All we did was make our people suffer even more. And the political issue of immigration is going to be there. And you know what? Senator Udall needs us to come out. Senator Durbin needs us to come out. There are Democrats who need us to come out and support. And what we have said to Latinos is we're waiting till after the election because we can wait till after the election. We should not use elections as a barometer of when we're going to have justice and fairness for our immigrant community. So, I think that's where we're at now. The president will elect. Here's what I think. Sometime before Christmas, some five million undocumented workers will be afforded an opportunity to come out of the shadows into the light of day. And everybody in this room has to get ready to help them, to receive them, to be ready to help them. It's not enough that we marched and we protested and we lifted our voices for them. Now we have to fill out the paperwork. We have to, have to find them, get them the resources, because no va a ser fácil ir de indocumentado a documentado. I don't care what the president does. It's going to be a difficult road, and as a community of people. You remember when we did it for the Dreamers in June of 2012? We will air prepared as a community for a million. Are we prepared for five? I think we have to get ready for them. I think that's our basic challenge. So I'm done. I'm ready for the president to act. The question is, are we ready to act in defense of our community once the president does that?
Congressman Crowley? I'm not following that. Yeah. Um, Put you in a lovely <laughs> position of being after Luis. Well, yeah, yeah you asked for, you know, where the state of play, and I, I don't think anyone could give a, a better answer to that than Luis at this point. I think we were all caught up in the, the euphoria, euphoric atmosphere of last summer when the Senate had acted. Luis was with me up in New York. Uh, we had, uh, with the Faith and Politics Institute, we led a delegation, a bi, uh, bipartisan delegation with Mario diaz Ballard uh, up to New York with Eric Cantor. Uh, we went to Liberty Island, went to Ellis Island, went to my district in Jackson Heights. Eric Cantor gave a great speech. He well, did. He gave a speech, uh, and a year later, Eric Cantor is no longer in Congress. Can't help us at this point. Uh, it shows the volatility, I think, of the, na the state of play of politics uh, throughout the country. Uh, and so uh, we, we, do, we, we can't help the political cycle or the calendar that we live under. Um, it, it's, it's set right now. It can be changed, but I don't suggest we do that. Uh, we have to work around that. Uh, as well. Uh, so we do have this period of waiting for the elections because we're not going back to, we're not coming back to Washington to work on legislation. That's clear. Although I think we ought to come back to have a vote on the uh, authorization of use of force. That's my opinion. Uh, that's a separate issue. Uh, we should come back and do that and debate that and have that vote. But having said that, I think we all wait. I know the Latino community cares uh, about a myriad of issues. This is an important and critical issue to the Latino community, but it's also an incredibly important issue to our country, for the future of our country. The best, the brightest, and I say the bravest uh, continue to come here to want to make America a better country, and we need to welcome them with open arms. And that's why I, I think we will get it done because we have to get this done. It's in the interest of our country to get this done. So um, the state of play, Luis has given it to you, and I'll turn it back with extra time. Members okay. of Congress usually don't do this, but I have a minute left to That's go, right, well, <laughs> and I'm giving it back. I'll remember that. <laughs> Thanks, Anna Jim. Navarro, uh, a little bit from the, from the other point of view, where from the Republican side, what's been the state of play there? How has how that evolved, and where do you see it now? Well, as far as where we are, I think right now we are at an impasse legislatively, but I think we cannot allow ourselves to be at an impasse in the fight for this. We have hit a roadblock right now, and I think after the happiness that we all felt when there was the bipartisan agreement in the Senate that was announced last year, and then now we're disillusioned because we are where we are. Nothing happened with that. We haven't gotten executive action. There's a lot of disillusionment in our community, and we cannot afford to be disillusioned. Patras ni para coger impulso. We have to keep going. We have to keep pushing. I will keep pushing my side, as Mario diaz Ballard and so many other Republicans will, and Democrats have to keep pushing your side. I think it's also very important that we, we realize that we are at a crossroads as a community. How we react, how we act upon these set of circumstances, I think will determine whether we become political pawns used at election time, or whether we outsmart the politicians and actually make them court and earn our support. I am, frankly, as far as state of play, I'm, I'm, I'm right now uh, upset, disappointed, and I'll tell you, I'm damn angry with all sides. Because why is it that it's always the Latinos and immigration that have to wait? We have had nothing but big promises for President Obama that have not been realized, and from the Republicans, not even promises. And that is unacceptable. We had a president who told us during the 2008 campaign that he was going to get immigration reform done the first year. And you know what? We let him get away with not doing it because la economía y esto y aquello y el bailout y, y, y el, el Obamacare and, you know, I mean, all these things, okay, and he got a pass. So then he promised again and, you know, on executive action. Well, that didn't happen because the children on the border and this and that. Somehow it's always Latinos that have to end up waiting. Everybody else gets their turn, but Latinos, I want to see un poquito más. You can wait just a little bit because it's not convenient because, I mean, for, for us to be told that the executive action is going to happen after the election is, I'm sorry to tell you this, the height of political cynicism. I mean, could it be more obvious and more blatant? Can't you at least lie to me? 
and tell me that that's not why you're doing it? And on the Republican side, my peeps haven't been all that good either. Because the good news is that when standards were announced in the beginning of the year, like Luis said, most people were okay with the standards. It was the timing they bought that. And yes, it is political cynicism to say we have to wait after the primaries, because there's primaries that don't end until August. And as far as Eric Cantor race, I think that was one of the biggest mistakes, most misread races by the media and the political class that we have had this year, the most misread, because it wasn't immigration that cost Eric Cantor his seat. It was Eric Cantor that cost Eric Cantor his seat. <laughs> So, Reverend Suarez, let me ask you about, uh, there, there has been an, an incredible um, coalition uh, that has come behind immigration reform, including churches uh, from all sides, including conservative-based churches uh, that, have, that are supporting immigration. Uh, is this delay, is the delay by Congress to pass anything and then the president delaying to decide to uh, take unilateral action? Is that hurting the coalition? Is the coalition concerned? I think the, I think the coalition is strong. I greet you on behalf of our 40,118 churches that still have faith, that we believe that this year, before the, the year is over, we're going to have some type of immigration reform, either through an act of God, which means Congress does something, or through executive action oh of the White House. <laughs> We believe something's God's going to get done. God's not looking too good these days. That's, I'm, that's the case. <laughs> I'm, I'm the preacher on the panel, so I have to ex you know, exhibit faith to you all. To, to us, immigration, is, it's, it's a vertical, it's a vertical uh, situation. And it's also horizontal. And I did also just bless you right now. <laughs> it's, it's vertical because this does matter to God. It's horizontal because it does matter to our people. Just yesterday, one of our pastors called. He's on his way to Arizona to identify the body of his brother-in-law who passed away in the desert in Arizona because he was lost for a month because he heard the trucks coming. He had lived in the country for 13 years, had been deported, has four children that were born in this country. Immigration picked them up in L.A., deported him. He came back to provide for his children. As he was crossing the border, he heard a truck. He was fearful that it was immigration and he ran. The coyote couldn't find him. He's been in the desert for a month, and now he's dead. I tell my colleagues and my evangelical brothers and sisters, if you are pro-life, you cannot be anti-immigration, because this is a life issue. Life, life is not just about conception. It's about that God cares about your life from the womb all the way to the tomb. And so as faith believers, as leaders of the faith community, Reverend Rodriguez, our president, and our 40,000 churches, we continue to fight for comprehensive immigration reform. It's time to get this done. There is no excuse for this to happen. This is the one issue that unites everybody in support except Congress. And so Congress needs to come in line with their constituents. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, that's sort of where we are. Let's talk a little, bit about, a little bit about where we're going. Congressman Guterres touched on this, and let me get you to expand upon it. Um, you have been in discussions with the White House. Uh, you are in touch with uh, groups who meet with the White House about what are the possibilities here. So what, what do we, let me ask you first of all about the, what your prediction is about what the president will do. You said five million undocumented to come out of the shadows. Who are those people? Who do you expect him to do, and what do you expect him to stay away? What's the third rail? Yeah. The first thing is, um, when I was asked what I thought, I used a large number, because I'm never going to negotiate my, with myself with a low number. <laughs> um, the important thing... So five that, million is optimistic. Well, I, but I think very realistic. And here's what. Every time I used to say something about what the White House would do, the White House would react and say, oh, Luis is wrong. I can't do that. No one at the White House has said they're not going to do 5 million people. That's a good thing. They have not responded either through the media or through their, as a matter of, they're pretty nice uh, when I speak about what it is they're going to do. So that gives me optimism, number one. If I were you, I'd be scared. Number one, I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic <laughs> about what we That's why I'm sitting between do. the two of them right now, just so you know. Number two, look. 
when we're sitting down with the President of the United States of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus, and we're negotiating on behalf of our community, um, the President responded by saying, if somebody's been here a few years, they've been working, they've established roots in their community, maybe they married somebody, even an American citizen, they have American citizen children, and by the way, there are five million American citizen children who have undocumented parents, then maybe they should be able to come forward at their own expense, register with the government, and if they have a clean bill of health, and, uh, criminally speaking, then we should give them a work permit and set them aside because there are murderers and rapists and bad people that Homeland Security should be going after and not good people who have established themselves and are contributing to our economy. That was his response. Now, let's say for a moment, just for, for, the pur for our purposes here, I know a lot of people need to understand, if the president, with the dreamers, he said in 2012, they had to be here five years. Remember that? They said they had to be here by 2007. He's going to pick a date for the other undocumented. Let's say he says it's 10 years. You know how many people it's 10 years? It's 5.6 million people. 5,600,000 people have been in this country 10 years or more undocumented. Then there is, the, the, there, there is that. And one last thing that I think is very, very important to show you how broken our immigration system is. They fixed the broken immigration system back in 97. The Republicans fixed it. And one of the things they did is they punished people that were here waiting for their visa. So if I, Luis Gutierrez, go out there and marry Soraida, and I prove to the government, A, that I'm a citizen, sponsoring an immigrant, and I prove that we're legally married, and she goes through a background check, they grant her a visa. But the problem is, when I take her to Manila, or I take her to Ciudad Juarez, or I take her to Dublin, or I take her back to the country she's from, they say, now stay there for 10 years. The president can do this. He can parole them in place. That's 1.3 million people who are legally trying to get through the system. These are husbands, wives, children, parents of American citizens and legal immigrants in the United States that are stuck, and the president can simply say, I parole them in place, and they can go straight and pick up their green cards and come back to America. So those are things that, those are two groups. If he picks 10 years, and he does a general, and he picks specific groups. And in terms of the dreamers, he picked 2007. But he picked 2007 and 2012. Well, we're in 2000, why doesn't he just up the date? Say, all the dreamers that arrived here in 2010. Why doesn't he change the date from 16 to 18? If he makes those kind of small changes, there's another 250,000 people. It's all important. Here's what I'm saying. We have to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and we need to prepare to help them. We need to prepare to help them. But we will leave no one behind. This is a down payment, and we will work hasta que la cuenta esté saldada con nuestra comunidad. Congressman Crowley, let me ask you about the prospects actually in the House, aside from what the President does. Um, in, at least in the House, there's n nobody's talking about the Democrats winning the House. So that's wait, not a wait, variable. Well, Luis and I are still talking. Okay. Well, you maybe <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a lonely conversation. Uh, <laughs> So in the, so, but in the House, it, it's likely to remain similar to what it is now. What are, what are the chances of anything progressing after the election in the House, after the President makes whatever limited changes he makes unilaterally? I should just first clarify, whenever Luis and I have a conversation, private conversation, there are at least five or six people talking at one time. So <laughs> it's very, very multiple. Um, I think it's an important question because what we're talking about, with whatever the president does in terms of executive order, it's not a temporary fix. It's a meaningful fix, and it will be very meaningful for the people that we're talking about in terms of numbers of people we can, in effect, help stay and help uh, contribute. Uh, and it stops the deportations. That's, that's one of the things we're looking for as well. What can we do to slow this down um, as well? Uh, but it does not remove the responsibility of Congress to act, to actually get a, a comprehensive bill passed. Uh, we're waiting to see what the results, first of all, this election will be. Was, that's what we do now. We'll wait until after that. Um, I, I, 
I, I wouldn't hold my breath, Reverend, waiting for a legislative fix between now and the end of the year. Uh, and if, uh, if there's any change in the Senate, uh, there's no incentive for them to want to act at this point in time. They'll wait till next year. I think it's pretty safe to say that the bill that was passed in the Senate, so it could be a good marker for the Senate, but that bill will, will die at the end of this year, and we'll have to start that process over again. And the makeup of the Senate is going to be important to determine whether they can get to the 60-vote margin to end cloture and anything they can bring to the floor at that point. Um, but I do, as I said before, I just think that we'll have to deal with this because it's, it's such an overwhelming humanitarian issue. It's a border security issue. It's a national security issue. It has to be dealt with. Um, I, the real question will be, and it goes back to uh, her peeps, uh, is the issue of whether or not within her party, uh, within the House representatives, can we have a real debate about this uh, amongst rational people about how we move forward uh, in dealing with this issue. Um, and that is what's really, we haven't been able to do that in the House of Representatives. We haven't had a debate. They'll be angry when the president acts uh, in an executive order. They're angry whenever the president does that. Uh, so this will be attacked. When he, whatever he does after the election, it will be attacked. And he has worked in the past on executive order to do something uh, uh, in, in light of uh, the Congress's failure to act legislatively. Um, I have high hopes. I really do. I believe that the country will rise to the occasion. We've done it in the past. Um, my, all four of my grandparents came here as immigrants. My mother was an immigrant. Uh, they came to this country because this country did big things. This is a big thing. I'm in the Congress to do big things uh, and to take political risks. Now, maybe this for me is not as big a political risk as it is for others. There are other issues that I'm willing to, to work on as well that, that, that present political risk for me. But I want to do big things, and accomplishing this will be one of the biggest things I can ever imagine doing in my career in Congress. And I have tremendous faith that we'll get to do, we will do something. We will do something. We'll have to act. So, Anna Navarro, um, let's talk a little bit about what the Republicans have done in Congress. Uh, they, they did um, propose several bills in the last Congress. All of them were pretty much border security bills. Very few of them dealt with, um, well, they did, one of them dealt with dreamers in a, in a pretty punitive fashion. Um, but in general, they have been border security bills. What's it going to take for the Republican Party, in your opinion, to move past border security, recognize um, that there are more, that more money is spent on our border than has ever been spent in history, uh, and concentrate on the real issue of immigration reform? You know, I think, I think even though um, by looking at TV and by looking at some of these bills that you just um, talked about, some of them, you know, which, I mean, most of them didn't go anywhere, right? They were just symbolic, but bad symbolism. I agree with you. They were symbolic bills that were pushed through by a small band of Republicans who wanted to make the symbolic point despite what it may mean for the party in general, for the country in general, and with, for relationships with Latinos. But I think the majority of Republicans, and I talk to a lot of them, both in the House and in the Senate, and out in regular America, are hearing from their constituents, the faith community, the business community, families, voters, and I think they're hearing over, employers, they're hearing over and over again that this issue needs to be addressed. There is a wide recognition that the status quo is broken, that the issue needs to be addressed. Yes, there is a vocal minority, and a lot of times they are able to wag the dog. There is a vocal minority in Congress who feels differently. And they have, frankly, punched above their weight and made more noise than they should have. But they can't get anything done by themselves. Look, I, what is it going to take for Republicans to realize it? I think most Republicans do realize it, but they haven't figured out that way to move it forward. Now, we have seen, since Barack Obama was elected president, we have seen the dynamic of a Democrat president, a Democrat House, and a Democrat Senate. Nothing happened. We've seen the Democrat president, the Republican House, and the Democrat Senate. Nothing happened. We may after November, we don't know, have both houses, the Senate and the House, under Republican hands. And the question is going to be, is that dynamic going to be any different? Will Mitch McConnell and John Boehner 
be able to agree on something in a way that John Boehner and Harry Reid have not. So I'm going to steal some of his faith and hope for that small miracle. So, so let me ask you, follow up on that just practically. Do you see a Republican majority in the Senate actually being beneficial for immigration reform? Yes. And can you, can you explain that to me or to us? I guess I can't do the faith thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, in my, I, I, think that, I think that John Boehner and Mitch McConnell have a good relationship. It is no secret that the relationship between John Boehner and Harry Reid uh, is at best non-existent. Um, I think both want to do, want to address immigration reform in a comprehensive way. It may not be what Luis wants, it may not be what I want, it may not be what Mario diaz Bellart wants or what most of us want, but it might be a package that addresses some of the major issues. And do you think it'll go past border security? Yes, because I think they understand. I mean, first of all, if it's only border security uh, by itself without it being sequential or something or having some sort of trigger mechanism, being part of a more comprehensive package, number one, I don't think the president would sign it. And number two, I don't think they would get it through. So yes, if they want to get something through, it's going to have to be carrots and sticks. And we as a community are going to have to come to terms with the fact that it may not be everything we want, but that it might be something we want. But again, that depends very much on the election results, which I believe are a coin toss today as far as who's going to be in the Senate. Unlike Congressman Crowley, I think the Republicans do keep control of the House. And so, Reverend, when you look at all this and, and how politics, if you, if you take Ms. Navarro's explanation of, of why uh, the Republicans have not put forward bills that address comprehensive immigration reform, but have only addressed border security, if you, if you take her explanation that it's a small group which has prohibited the, the Republicans from exhibiting their real will, what they really want to do. That's how I understood your point. But Jim, let's remember that there were four Republican senators who teamed up with four Democrat senators who did put forth a comprehensive right, bill. on the Senate side. Okay, right. But a bit, and, and, and that there was also an active small group, an active small group, doing, trying to do the same thing and putting a lot of effort and political capital led by Mario diaz Bolard and Luis Gutierrez on the House side. They couldn't get it done but they put a lot of time, political capital, and, and effort on their part. So I, I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, that only bad things have happened. The, neither, of the, neither the bad things nor the good things have come to reality, but there's been a lot of effort on the good things as well. And I'll let Luis chime in on that, but let me, let me just get, let me get your opinion on when you watch the politics of this. It must be for someone who's outside of that realm. Disappointing to see th that that occurring when, when if it's true that all the, that a majority of the Republicans believe that the system is broken and needs to be fixed, and a majority of the Democrats do, but still nothing happens. Yeah, well, <clears throat> for the last several years, what we heard from leaders in the House was, "Cover us. We're going to get it done." We're going to get it done in November. Then we're going to get it done in June. And we've covered and we've prayed and we've stood and nothing has happened. There was courage in the Senate to get something done. The problem was that there wasn't a, Mario, uh, a Marco Rubio in the House on the Republican side that would stand up, take courage, not be scared of the Tea Party or any other party and say, look, we have to get this done. It is disheartening. You know, as a, as a, as a, as a pastor, I teach that there's power in prayer. But as a citizen, there's power in my vote. And the best thing that I can do and tell my constituents, and we're doing this with our, our work with uh, different organizations, I like guess CIU, Mi Familia Vota, what, we're, what are we telling our people? You must show up to vote. Because I don't, think, I don't think Congress has felt the consequences of us voting against, or not voting for those that do not support immigration reform. And as evangelicals, we voted, the 28% that voted for Governor Romney 50% of that 28% of Hispanics 
was evangelicals. That will not happen again. If you do not support immigration reform, you will not get the Hispanic vote, and you're not going to get the evangelical vote. It's very, they have to realize this. And let me, let me ask the entire panel, and then and Luis, you can chime in on this as well, but let me start with you on your end. Yes, the the uh, unaccompanied minors crisis that happened um, this year, mm -hmm. uh, the president in his interviews um, in, in explaining why, one of the reasons why, or maybe even the main reason why he delayed action until after the elections was he's admitted that he lost the support of the American people. And he blamed that on uh, unaccompanied minors crisis, that that frightened America and, they were not, and he needed time to educate re-educate folks about why they should support immigration reform right. again. Do you agree with him? Do you, did, you see a, did you see people afraid because of what they were seeing what was happening at the border? I think the president made a profit out of Reverend Sam Rodriguez, my boss, because he said in 2007, today's complacency will become tomorrow's captivity. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, p kids are captive at the border. Parents are captive. Is my kid coming? Are they sending him home? And yeah, we need to re-educate. We need to reinvigorate the, the situation. But um, we, it's just, it's time for someone to act. And if it's the president, it's the house. Just someone, please do what you say you're going to do. What effect do the rest of you think that the, uh, the crisis at the, at the, with the unaccompanied minors let me, created? Let me try to do a few things. Number one. There was, this was not an American crisis. 70, 80,000 kids showing up at the borders of the most powerful, strongest nation in the world. It's a crisis of Central America. You know what it is? It's a logistical headache for us that we can take care of. Amen. I mean, 125,000 Marialitos showed up. And I don't remember the Republicans standing up and saying, send them back. And saying, we will not receive them. So... Let's just understand that what the Republicans did was they used the children at the border and exploited them for political gain by saying they were criminals, that they were dirty, filthy criminals, they were coming here to destroy America. And that's what they said. I'm not adding or subtracting to the speeches that they gave on the House floor. One of them said they were bringing the Ebola virus to America. Now, unfortunately, we've had the first case. And it is a tragedy in Africa. They even use a tragedy in Africa because here's the problem that we have. The problem that we have is that of the 11 million undocumented, right, 5 million of them never crossed that border. Illegal, 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 illegal. Pero lo único que hablan son los de los mexicanos. That's the only people that they ever talk about. So if you were to seal that border down, people would still overstay their student visa. People would still overstay their work visas. People would still overstay their tourist visa. People would still be in this country undocumented in the United States of America. But they keep now, and the new thing is that the terrorists are coming through. They have American passports. Yeah. Why would they need a coyote? You need a coyote because you don't have a passport. <laughs> It, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I'm just going to, because I think it's important to have these conversations. There are dozens of wonderful men and women in the Republican caucus that want to get this done. But their leadership will not allow them to join Democrats in the House of Representatives to get it done. Que vergüenza, que pena, que lástima, que hay hombres y mujeres, una gran mayoría, the Republicano y Democrata, but we can't get it done because the leadership will not allow us to get it. What did we tell them? They said, oh, everybody can't become a citizen. You remember this, Jim. And I said, okay, everybody can't become a citizen. And then they said, oh, let me think. Uh, we can't do the Senate bill. I said, well, let's do a House bill. Let's just do it better. They said, oh, we have to do it in parts and pieces. Remember? Even the president said, okay, let's start putting the pieces together. We said, yes, 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 and yes. And in the end, they walked away. I understand that Democrats walked away before and didn't show incredible courage, but that was yesterday. I'm talking about who is in power and has the capacity to do it today. But there is a difference, because my daughter told me, I don't see candidates for the U.S. Senate that are Democrats, right, going and using immigration, right, 
against the Republican. No, it is Republicans in Arkansas, in Louisiana, in the Carolinas, and across this country that are using immigration in order to gain a majority in the U.S. Senate. And I'm supposed to believe that you're going to pound the hell out of the electorate, and then you're going to come back and be good to immigrants when you've won the election. I can't believe that. Look. I'm going to end with this because I want others to say. The president said he has the authority to act. The president needs to act. If the Congress of the United States will not afford our community justice and fairness, and that we're willing to do according to their rules and regulations, then the president has to act. But let me just be clear to Democrats and Republicans alike. If Mitch McConnell and Speaker Boehner or any two leaders of the Republican Party, watch this, it's Wednesday. It's the day after the election in November. I can hear them already. Oh, we are going to make a priority of immigration reform, but the president better not spoil the well by acting unilaterally. No, 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 no. <laughs> ya ustedes tuvieron su oportunidad. The president got elected by 5 million more votes than Mitt Romney. He said to the dreamers he would free them and that that was a down payment. It is now time for the president to act. We will not accept an excuse on the Democratic side, and we should not accept any Republicans telling us to wait. Ya hemos esperado suficiente. No más deportaciones, no más de separaciones de nuestra familia, una falta de injusticia de un día más. Es inaceptable para nuestra comunidad que el presidente actúe. Robert. If anybody else wants to add to that, I'm certainly happy to let you at this point or take it on or whatever you want to do. I do want to also turn to the audience and see if there are questions there. Uh, be, be, say before we go on there, yes. let me just say something about, sure. about what Luis said. I agree with a lot of what he said. But I, and I, and you know, you began the question as to the minors on the border. Did that change public opinion? Yes. Should it have? No. But did it? Yes. But at the end of the day, you and I know that it wasn't that that held the president back. It was Mary Landrieu, Mark Bagich, Mark Pryor picking up the phone and calling the White House over and over again and saying, if you do executive action, you're going to cost us our election. So they've been just as political as the people that you just talked about. And they should be unacceptable to all of us that that's what these folks are doing. And let's remember this. Because you know what? Who has control of the Senate may come down to Louisiana. Y hay muchos hondureños en Louisiana. And I hope that they remember that Mary Landrieu was on the phone asking the White House not to do executive action so she could save her seat. With that, te lo devuelvo. All right, let's go to the audience for some questions. Thank you for those lights. Uh, the microphone's up here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm kind of excited. I'm kind of nervous at the same time, but I have to share uh, this before my question. Uh, I'm a state representative in Phoenix, Arizona, married to a person that's in process that was detained the last session before finishing my session this term. Um, this day and age, and we, it affects us all. But my question is this, and I'm, and I'm confused. I understand the issue at the federal level here in Washington how that translates to my local area in Arizona is that I am a Democrat, registered Democrat, and I have my own Democratic Party whose priorities don't match that of the federal. So we're, I'm, I'm at, a, at, a, at a miss. So I'm passionate about immigration. I, I'm organizing the massive marches, you name it. But there's a very big disconnect. Reverend, again, the, the, uh, the faith-based uh, pro-life, I, I tra how does that translate as well to my Christian churches in, in my, I, I understand we've got to organize and we've got to register and we've got to do that work. But there's a very big disconnect. I don't know if it's only Arizona or that is happening all the way across the nation. And what needs to happen, what can we do? And I'm, I have expectations for every elected official to start speaking the truth and speaking about their, their challenges within their parties because this should not be a partisan issue. 
And you're right, all this is unacceptable, but it's up to us. So where are we? Where well, let me, let, me, let me just say, first of all, um, that I think the issue of immigration and how we approach it should be a nonpartisan issue. Um, I want to work with everyone that wants to work to solve the problem of our undocumented community, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. But moreover, I have done that. And I have challenged my own party time and time again to be better so that we understand the way this works, right? I was disillusioned because I remember in 1997, Reverend, I, I, I voted against the Defense of Marriage Act. Because I said, what two men and two women want to do that fall in love, I, start, I didn't say I'm going to wait till the rest of the country catches up to how I feel about gay and lesbian people. I didn't wait. I had my conscience. I felt how I was going to vote, and I voted that way. And I think part of the problem in the Democratic Party with immigration is still this, that we would not wait until after November if it was an issue affecting the gay and lesbian community necessarily. We wouldn't say, oh, no lo vamos a hacer hasta después de las elecciones, que siguen sufriendo. If this was about women's reproductive rights, if this was about the minimum wage, if this was about a series of other issues, the Democratic Party would come together. But we are better shaped today than we've ever been before on the issue of immigration as a Democratic Party. Let me just say that. Because I think one of the things we need to understand is that every Democratic senator in the Senate last year voted for comprehensive immigration reform. And if just the Democratic senators had voted for it, there would have been enough of them to pass immigration reform without one Republican. They all voted for it. And I think it's kind of a shame that Mary Landrieu, who voted for immigration reform, is now, of course, by her Republican opponent, because she wants to win the election and get back, being challenged on the issue of immigration and saying that she's for illegal immigrants. She's for fixing our broken immigration system. That she called the president until after the election? She might have. She probably did. So here's my thing to everybody here. Look, register to vote because every year 900,000 Latinos turn 18 and they're all American citizens. They're all American citizens. And we have 8 million of which 7 million are Latinos that can become citizens tomorrow. I'm going to work on registering all that youth and making sure that all the people that can become citizens become citizens. But I'm also going to stand up for our immigrant community so that they can know to register to vote for somebody because of principle and values. Oye, y tú no sabes, por tú sabes que la pregunta de ella fue de Arizona, ¿no? I get that. <laughs> and you know, and I think at the same time... So let me and, just tell you about Arizona. I think it's very confusing. To me, it's very confusing to have a state that's got Joe Arpaio on one hand and Jeff Flake and John McCain, who were both co-authors of the bipartisan agreement in the Senate. So we can't help you <laughs> interpret Arizona. Te lo dejo, te lo dejo en tus manos, but he'll pray about it. Well, I'll well, pray about it. <laughs> and, 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 let, and, and let me add, because at the state level, Arizona needs to know that they elected Steve Montenegro who is the son of an undocumented immigrant who came to this country seeking amnesty or political asylum, and now he opposes immigration reform. And Steve Montenegro needs to remember that he is the product of an undocumented immigrant, and he needs to stand up for the others that are in Arizona. When you go to the churches, don't go politically. Come with the moral argument, because there's not a church in America that can argue against the moral problem that this is. I would, I would also just add, I, my experience from the members of Congress in the House on the Democratic side, uh, Kirkpatrick, uh, 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 Cinema, and, and Barbara, they're prepared to take, I think, very courageous votes if they're given that opportunity. The Senate has acted. The, the Senate did take a difficult vote. The Senate, as you made reference to, in this political environment that we're living in right now, their election, their, their, uh, whether they return back to the Senate or not, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a political issue. When it came to the policy and the politics, they took a courageous vote last year. The House hasn't taken that vote. And I've seen the House act. I've seen the House act on very difficult issues, the Violence Against Women's Act. I've seen them on Sandy Aid, a very tough, I'm from New York, a very difficult uh, vote that took place. I saw the House act on the issue of uh, extending our, our, our debt ceiling, a very politically charged issue. And by the way, all three of those issues passed the House with a majority of Democrats a majority of the minority, and a minority of the majority, a minority of Republicans voting for them. So they have the will to put a bill on the floor 
to pass it without the majority of the, of the, of the majority and the majority of the minority. They just won't do it for immigration reform. They haven't, they had the opportunity. They knew the votes were there from the Democratic side with a, with a number of good Republicans to support that. They didn't have the political will to put it on the floor. Go to the go lady here in the front. I think the microphones are back there. That's the problem. Maybe you're gonna have to go back there. Go ahead. Oh. I apologize. Uh, hello, my name is Rafael Hurtado. Um, I'm currently a CHCI uh, public policy fellow. Um, also from La Villita, Chicago. So this question is for my congressman uh, and the other House member. Um, so I believe that undocumented uh, individuals contribute to both the informal and formal economy, but I also think that immigration is an issue because of this country's sick addiction to cheap labor. Um, so one of the things I ask is, what can be done or what is going to be done um, in regards to making sure that those people who are currently uh, employed and currently undocumented do not become discriminated against when they are no longer legally considered cheap labor? Mm. Well, first of all, um, here's what happens. And I think we should just all agree to this, that undocumented workers in this country, because of their undocumented status, actually lower the wages for American workers. They act as a lower, because employers take advantage of that labor force and the ability to exploit that labor force. But listen, if you talk to any one of the 700,000 dreamers that today have taken advantage of DACA, they all have the same social security card that I do and they have a work permit and they work here in the workforce so they're no longer exploited. They now can participate fully. And so by bringing about comprehensive immigration reform, actually we raise the wages of everyone. The undocumented wages actually increase and the wages of other Americans are no longer stifled by using an underclass of American workers in order to reduce their wages. So I think the way to do it is to do it through comprehensive immigration reform so that the wages of everyone can increase. I think that that's fundamentally. Now, let me just say this. Moving forward, foreign hands are going to pick the food in foreign lands or in America. And that is a constant that is going to uh, continue. ¿Verdad? Las manos extranjeras, who's going to pick the lettuce and the tomato and the cucumbers and the grapes? Ustedes saben que no va a recoger. It's always going to be us. I was sharing with Anna that, that she, she says she doesn't leave Miami that much, but I was 45 minutes outside of Miami. Y la gente piensa en Miami y piensa en Nicaraguans y piensa en Cubans, right? And uh, they think of Puerto Ricans. But you want to know something? Go 45 million to 45 minutes, minutes outside of Miami to any one of the orchards that are out there, the orange orchards that are out there. Y sabes lo que hay? Pura raza mexicana. That's all that's out you there. Know what? So there might be a distinction. So the point is, look, there are always going to be a need for people to be able to come to this country and to do the kind of back-breaking work. And let me tell you something. I know that we're ready to do that. Work. I got to tell you, Luis, I got I to gotta, I pitch in here. Uh, yes, everything you said is true, but there's a need for much more than that. And we cannot just stereotype ourselves as people who are picking lettuce and picking tomatoes, which is a, a un trabajo digno. It's something that we should be proud that our people are doing. But our people are also building computers. And our people are also operating on, on brains and on hearts. And our people are also teaching in the schools. And we are an aging community. We are an aging nation here in the United States. We need the influx of new blood in order to do all the jobs. But let it not be said and let the image be that Hispanics are only this or only that. We are yeah, but, a Anna, wide, the reason, the reason I raised that issue, let me tell you the reason I raised that issue. Yeah, but you, you shouldn't. But you let me, shouldn't, but let me, you no, shouldn't I think be I so, should, and I really they, don't. Because they keep saying, they should all just go. We should just all deport them, right? And my point is this. No, no, let me yeah, tell you something. They should all self-deport. No, Mitt Romney Listen, and Louis, the Republican that, that, uh, Party platform in 2012 was self-deportation. That they should all leave. And, and what so did I say election night on CNN? He self-deported from the White House. Anna, Anna. Anna. And here's my point. Here's my point. By the way, if this Ebola thing continues, we may want to reconsider self-deportation. Here's my point. My point is this. They, they do dirty, filthy, backbreaking work, and they still get accused of being on welfare. And they still get accused of taking food stamps. And they still get accused. Work, 
Let's be clear. Para doctores y para científicos, todo el mundo le da la bienvenida, hasta los republicanos dicen que vengan. Pero el problema no es ese. El problema es, who is going to do that other work? And my only point to everybody here is that they are, ese es un trabajo digno, el que trabaja en el campo. And I want to make sure, because the Republicans tomorrow would sit down with me and said, we'll give you all the doctors, technicians, computer wizards you want, Luis, they can all come. But don't bring any of those Mexicans here to the United States of America to work in our agriculture. They want to have a bracero program of the past to deal with our agricultural industry. And my only point is this, no more bracero programs. Aquí hay dignidad y respeto para todos los trabajadores. No importa de dónde vengan. One of the things that, that, if I could just add to this discussion just a bit, I just returned from Houston, Texas, where uh, they're absorbing thousands of unaccompanied minors, unaccompanied children into the school system. And I spoke to these children who had uh, just come here from, many of them on their own. I couldn't believe these little, the little kids, 10-year-old kids, who had come from Guatemala, from Honduras, on their own, on buses and across through coyotes. And I asked them, you know, uh, it was a, a group of them at a table, and I said, what do you want to be? Why'd you come here? Doctor, engineer. Um, you know, those are, the, those are the people who are our future. Uh, they came here to get an education. They may have to, you know, their parents probably, who are here, uh, many of them are here, are probably working in the kitchen today. But the dream for their kids is to do what you're saying, is to, is to, is to do that. But America, most of us know, and we've seen the movies, we've seen the document, documentaries, that without the Mexicans who've come across the border undocumented at this point, we couldn't get our lawns done. We couldn't, a day, a, a day in the United, this country without undocumented workers would be a very slow day. Uh, most of us know that. Uh, we have time for one more question, I'm afraid. Yes. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sara Echevarria. I'm also from Chicago. I am a teacher there. I think you packed the audience. <clears throat> no. <laughs> no. To Chicago. I think we're just yeah. faster at the mics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, we're all disappointed that President Obama decided to wait until after the midterm election. Well, the problem is that the midterm elections may just not turn out his way now. And according to what Ms. Navarro says, guess what? Maybe by a miracle, or maybe not so much by a miracle, but there's a chance that it could, the Republicans can take over the House and the Senate. Well, if that were to be the case, or I don't know if it is, and then the president may decide then by executive order to put forth the a comprehensive uh, ref immigration reform. But that also poses the following. If he does it by executive order, then what are the chances of the Republicans filing a lawsuit and challenging that? That's one thing I think that's for Gutierrez. But for Ms. Navarro's, you said, okay, so if the Senate and the House becomes Republican, and then by chance, and I'm quoting you, by, they may pass some kind of, and you say some kind of comprehensive uh, reform, you know, some way it might happen, that sounds a little bit disturbing because it's like, well, we're going to water it down. We're just going to do something some kind, some way, because now they have control. But wouldn't that bring us back to the same issue because it wouldn't be comprehensive enough? So we wouldn't be solving this problem. So and, and we have, I have to ask you to make your answers short here at this time because we, we do have to wrap up. So, you want to take that first, Anna? Yeah, look, I, I, I think we're all going to, if Republicans take over the House and the Senate, I think we're all going to have to push. I agree with Luis that uh, if uh, the president takes executive action, Republicans are going to be angry. And I would say to my party, the best way to avoid executive action is to take legislative action, pass something, do something. And that's the best way to deter any executive action. If each branch does their job, you don't need to supersede the other branch. Now, as far as watering down on what the comprehensive immigration bill is going to look like, I have no idea. I think we're going to see, uh, we would see a lot of pushing from the different constituent groups, business, labor, faith, et cetera, family reunification. So I have no idea. I'm not ready to uh, poo-poo anything until I see it. 
So I'll be cautiously optimistic until I see something that makes me pessimistic. But until then, let me hold on to my little, you know, raft of optimism. I would just, before right. Lucas, I, I, we are, are going to hold the president's feet to the fire. He has said that he will do something after the elections. We've had many meetings on this. We're not sitting back and waiting after the elections for the president. We're going right on him right away to fulfill that promise and even do more than we had anticipated he was going to do beforehand. We think that he owes that much, at least to us at this point in time. But it just comes back to you said before, uh, in my own experience, 100 years my family has been here. Uh, my grandparents came here poor never anticipated that their grandson would be a member of Congress today. It's the exact same level of, 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 of courage that these people today, these little kids are experiencing. Tremendous, I have a nine-year-old son. I could never imagine him uh, going around the block, nevertheless, uh, across a desert uh, to come to the United States. But it's about the fulfillment of a dream uh, to be everything they can be. And we ought not deny that. We should welcome it. I think... You ask the question, well, what if they take over the Senate and they keep the House and they file lawsuits and, and they obstruct? Well, let me just say, I welcome that fight. If the President of the United States acts to protect millions of undocumented workers and allows them to come out of the shadows and legalize their status, here's what I believe will happen. I believe that Reverend Suarez and the tens of thousands, hundreds, and millions of people who are parishioners in his faith-based community are going to unite with the Democrats and some Republicans in the House. I think that Anna Navarro and I started out fighting for Nicaraguans so that over 100,000 of them today could have legalized status in this country. I believe that Anna's going to fight. I believe that everybody in this room is ready for that kind of fight. Just imagine for a moment the President of the United States makes an announcement. We figure out who the five, six million people are, right? We get ready to register them, and the Republican majority decides that they're going to obstruct that process. They will be the end of the Republican Party as a national party in the United States of America. Because then it won't be that the Democrats didn't act and that the Republicans didn't act. It will be the last act. We all understand this. Take me 30 seconds. We all understand that, oh, we offered you new housing. Oh, they didn't come through on the new housing. Better health care. They didn't come through on the health care. Oh, better education. They didn't come. Oh, we we're going to reduce your property taxes. We get all of that stuff. But this is very different. This is a concrete example of justice and fairness for a community of people that we love and that we cherish and that we will defend. And so I'm ready for the president to act. And let me tell you something, whoever attacks the decision of the president to bring justice and fairness to millions of undocumented uh, immigrants and allow them to have justice in this country, I'm ready for that fight. And I'm ready to join everybody in this room in winning that fight. Kevin Suarez, you want to give 30 seconds here just to wrap it up, please? I'll just close by saying don't lose faith and don't lose hope. The God that I preach, the Bible teaches that he created this, the heavens, the sun, the universe. He did it all in seven days. And every time I have a media interview, they say, do you really believe there's enough time <laughs> to get it done? The God that I preach did all of that in seven days. I have faith and I speak faith over you. Let's believe together que vamos a ver una reforma hecha en este país en el nombre de Jesús. Esto se va a hacer and nobody can stop it. Republicans, it's going to happen. God wants immigration reform. Well, thank you very much all for attending, and I want to uh, lead the applause in thanking for our panelists for a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I do, have a, I do have a couple of um, real quick announcements before we leave the stage, because I've been asked to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, you don't want to miss President Obama, who will be here at tomorrow evening's gala event, starting with the reception at 5 o'clock. I understand there might even be some people outside with signs. Uh, please get here early so you can have time to get through security. They're not guaranteeing admittance into the room after 7 o'clock. Uh, now, this evening, that evening is a, is a packed with other amazing speakers, special guests, entertainment, and the presentation of CHCI's highest honors at that gala. And remember to also tell your friends and family not to miss a beat. They can tune in the, to the gala streaming live on CHCI's uh, website as well. And there's also some social media information, I'm told, that will be on the screen behind me. 
And don't forget about the Reyes of Comedy that's uh, tonight. And thank you for joining us. That concludes the 2014 CHCI Public Policy Conference. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. <laughs>